All right, so we're going to get into altered cellular and tissue biology. So really what that means, it's, the, it's kind of getting into, getting into some of the pathophysiology of cells, the changes that can happen to cells like hypertrophy, atrophy, uh, the plasias, dysplasia, metaplasia, those kinds of things. And then we'll also talk about necrosis and um, uh, gangrene and then, of course, apoptosis. So what we're, what we're kind of dealing with here is how cells respond when they have different nutritional uh, exposure. So, uh, so cells respond to their internal environment. Okay, so so they just know what's around them. They know if they're getting enough oxygen. They know that if they're if they're working really hard and they require more oxygen or they more, require more to do. If there's more demand on them, uh, then they'll then they'll make adjustments to that. So overall, though, uh, I have here it says most of the cells of the bodies are efficient, and I have in here uh, in parentheses lazy. So what that means is it's kind of like. Uh, and, and we, we kind of express that in the way that we move around. Uh, we, we have a lot of devices that make things easier for us because really we're kind of programmed even down to the cell level to not put out, not use any energy if we really don't have to. So, uh, so we're trying to be very energy efficient. Now, uh, we've gotten so good at it that a lot of times people don't do you know, anything at all and we really don't have to move around that much as, as we used to. And so we kind of supplement that by exercising because we know that's healthy. But in general, a cell, if a cell doesn't, isn't being used, if it's not doing anything, then the body's not going to uh, it's not going to spend resources on it. So the cell may shrink, the cell may, may die completely. Um, so, so that's kind of a, uh, that's kind of an adjustment we have to, we have to think about, but that works well because if, you know, if you increase the demand, then the cell can adjust that way too, and it can become, you know, larger, stronger, more efficient. Okay, so cells can also respond to increased demands, right? So they can, they can uh, if they, they're not used, they, they don't waste resources, they shrink or die. They may get larger, increase in number if the demand increases. And if they're constantly being, I, I think smoking is a good example, uh, like the, some of the tissue in your lungs, if if you're if you're constantly sort of bombarding it with uh, with like uh, adverse it says it says adverse conditions but smoking is is one of those but if you if you kind of I, I want to use the word toxins but if you're constantly kind of damaging cells then they may change uh, reversibly for a little while uh, but they can but they can actually change irreversibly and we'll we'll kind of see what what that is when we get into the dysplasias um, so cells must adapt usually by changing gene expression so we say well how does the cell get larger how does it get smaller well it may turn on genes that or turn off genes to uh, to make those adjustments so it may adjust in size it may adjust in the number of cells that are that are lining it, lining a tissue let's say or muscles um, that would be a, a increase in size uh, differentiation which is uh, changing cell type so a lot of times they may go from epithelial to uh, say squamous cell or some or uh, columnar epithelial to squamous epithelial cells. So if they can't overcome the stressor, they may not survive. And that would be where we get into apoptosis or necrosis. And we'll talk about all those things. So these are this is what we're going to cover right now, cellular adaptations. So atrophy is a decrease in size. And we're going to go through each one of these individually. But atrophy is a decrease in size. And we can see the pictures over here associated with these. Hypertrophy is an increase in cell size. Hyperplasia is an increase in cell numbers. Note the difference between hypertrophy, which is an increase in size, and hyperplasia, which is an increase in numbers. Metaplasia is replacement of one cell type with another. That means the cell will actually change types. That's what I was kind of giving that example with changing from um, epithelial, squamous epithelial to columnar, which happens with Barrett esophagus, or the other way around, which happens with, uh, with smoking. So dysplasia is deranged cellular growth. Now this is where we're starting to uh, kind of lose control of the, of the cell identity, really. Uh, okay, so atrophy. The cell, and therefore the organ or tissue, becomes smaller. What are the advantages? So why is it doing this? So the big advantage is it's, it's a decrease in oxygen consumption. If you, if you have a smaller cell, it's going to require 
fewer resources. And that really, if it comes down to like a question of some type, that's really what we're, what we're after. Why do we have atrophy? We have atrophy because there isn't a demand there. And so the body's going to not throw a bunch of resources at it. Okay. Uh, one of those in particular being oxygen, fewer and smaller organelles to support. Okay. So the mitochondria may get smaller, the ER, other parts of it uh, may get smaller, produces fewer uh, proteins which is the last one here. Fewer proteins are made, made, which also decreases energy and resource use and demand. Okay, so if it's smaller, it doesn't need as much. So types of atrophy. So there's disuse, so we're just not using it. So this could be uh, an arm encased in a cast. Okay, so a patient on a ventilator, if you've got a ventilator that's actually doing the breathing, a lot of times you can have atrophy of the diaphragm muscle. Okay, so Think about that. If you have if you have atrophy of this diaphragm muscle, okay. So let's say it was you know it's it's a thin muscle anyway, but let's say that it atrophied and becomes thinner. Now are you going to be able to take that person off the ventilator just right away if they've been on it for a long time and some atrophy has happened? Well, the answer would be no because they may not be able to support their own ventilation for a little while, and you'll have to get that back up that cell that that muscle cell is going to or that muscle in general, the muscle cells are going to have to regain their strength. They're going to have to, uh, to grow a little more, which would be hypertrophy. Um, so prolonged immobility. So all of these things are, uh, are disuse. Now, there's something else called denervation. So if you have, and I have down here a picture, this might happen with someone who has a spinal cord injury or something like that. And if you've cut, so if you've, if you've uh, damaged the lower motor neurons, the neurons that are actually going to the muscle in this case, okay, if you've actually damaged these, these neurons, so those neurons are no longer there, that's why I have the X through it, then all of the muscle cells that that neuron was innervating are also going to just go away because there has to be some kind of feedback. They have to they have to know that they have a purpose. So they they have receptors. They have uh, they're they're producing signaling molecules that are saying yes yes we're still connected things are still here. If those goes away go away, then these muscle cells really have no purpose. Okay, so they really aren't serving a purpose. Therefore, the body will get rid of them. It'll just say, well, you know, there's, uh, or it'll, they'll shrink. Ultimately, they can, they can actually go away, but they will, um, they will atrophy. And so you'll have muscle atrophy overall. So, so when you look at uh, denervation injury that happens with someone who is, uh, who has those lower motor neurons that have been severed, then you'll see, you'll see the, uh, the muscles that are being that are being innervated by that shrink. Okay, so if this one shows this one is still intact, and so these these I guess whatever color that is reddish kind of color, then those will those will remain those will remain intact. So these are still okay. Okay, so denervation atrophy a form of disuse atrophy. It's disused, but because the the disuse is being caused by a uh, nerve supplying it being being. Uh, gone or damaged. So if the nerve supplying a muscle or organ is damaged, the target lacks stimulation and feedback. So there's no more of that feedback and it will atrophy. Okay. So this can, uh, this can apply to complete or partial denervation. Uh, so there, there are instances where uh, maybe a, uh, a nerve has been, it's been stunted or something like that. Some kinds of uh, stenosis, spinal stenosis, things like that, uh, that can, that can limit, limit the activity too. Okay. So types of atrophy. So what, what can cause this? What can cause atrophy in general? So we talked about, um, we talked about disuse and we talked about denervation. But there are other things that can cause atrophy outside of those kinds of things, and that would be hormonal. So hormones may affect tissue and organ size. So an example are breast and sex organ atrophy. That happens, really this is associated with menopause primarily, but, but any kind of limitation in uh, hormones that are, that are there to kind of build something up. Okay, so the estrogens, progesterone, those kinds of things. Um, that's, that's, uh, these are, well, I guess in this example, it's talking about breast and sex organs. So you can have atrophy of the, uh, 
uh, vaginal atrophy, breast atrophy that happens uh, when, when the estrogen levels are, are decreased. Testosterone abuse may lead to testicular atrophy. So uh, that's kind of a feedback, but, but, tes but testosterone will start doing the job of the cells in the testicles and so, so these, these uh, Leydig cells that are, that are in the tes testes, which are supposed to be producing testosterone, will, will stop. They'll stop producing it, and the, and the testes will, will shrink. Okay, so restriction of nutrients. Well, that just kind of makes sense. If you restrict the nutrients to a cell, then that cell is not going to be able to survive. So it's going to adapt. It's going to make an adaptation, and it's going to try to, try to continue to survive with fewer resources, which means it's going to get smaller. Okay, so that's inadequate nutrition. Ischemia would also kind of fall into this category. Now remember, ischemia is when you are some in some way restricting blood flow. So that could happen from atherosclerosis. But if you but if you restrict blood flow to a certain area, then the cells that are around it aren't going to get the uh, aren't going to get the resources that they need, and so so those cells could could shrink, so that could cause uh, organ atrophy. Actually, if it's if it's leading to a uh, to a certain organ, so prolonged periods with decreased blood flow force the cells to adapt to survive with the, these uh, the fewer nutritional resources in general. Okay, so that's atrophy. How about hypertrophy? An increase in size of a cell or body part associated with an increase in increase in demand. So we saw a decrease in demand earlier, now we see an increase, and so these these cells can can get larger. So it's common in cardiac and skeletal muscle cells. I have the question here, why? Why would you why would you see it in skeletal muscle cells and cardiac cells? More specifically, um, why would you why would you not see uh, I guess um, I, I guess I guess the question is really why would you not see that in smooth muscle cells as much because smooth muscle cells are capable of cell division okay so I don't know if you remember that but smooth muscle cells can increase in in number okay which is we're going to learn is uh, hyperplasia but uh, skeletal muscle cardiac muscle cells they can't really divide and so the only thing that they can do to adjust is to get larger, which is which is what this hypertrophy is. So genes are turned on in, uh, and so the question is, can muscle cells undergo mitotic division? Well, cardiac and skeletal muscle cells can't undergo mitotic division. Smooth muscle cell can. Okay, so genes are turned on in muscle cells to make new actin and myosin. So remember our, our little actin filaments, or our actin filaments, and then our myosin myosin motor protein. So that's going to increase strength because that's where the muscle pull is coming from and so you're going to have you could have an increased number of those and uh, and that's going to cause the muscle to get larger uh, as well as increasing size and or number of organelles okay so you've got sarcoplasmic reticula uh, enzymes enzymes you know if you have more activity then you're going to have more enzymes more which can produce more ATP so everything is going to increase which is going to make that cell get larger okay so left ventricular hypertrophy is um, is is what we see here okay so left ventricular hypertrophy and uh, this one is normal the one on the right is normal and what you see is you see a very thick ventricle now there's something that we might want to look at here and we'll, we'll look at this again but you notice when this muscle gets larger, so in during left ventricular hypertrophy, that the amount of space to hold blood actually becomes smaller. Okay, so you have a reduced amount of space. So I have also here, so so we can just going back and looking at you know the thickness of the muscle, okay, right here. So that's a thicker muscle than we see over here. Okay. Um, but the question is what what increase in demand may cause may cause your left ventricle to get larger and really the the easy answer to that or one of the easy answers to that it would be more pathological but would be atherosclerosis okay. atherosclerosis is when you have the vessels like in the aorta or its branches develop these plaques that restrict blood flow. Okay, so that's going to uh, that's going to increase what's called your afterload, and so it's going to take more 
pressure, that ventricle is going to have to squeeze harder to push blood past those, those uh, restrictive areas. Okay, so that's going to mean your blood pressure might be, you know, uh, a little bit higher, but, but, um, which is generally the case. But, that's, but the heart's going to have to work harder to push through these vessels that are kind of getting clogged up with stuff. So that's, that's one of the things we look at when we look at uh, uh, ventricular hypertrophy is we say, okay, well, you know, the important thing is, well, <laughs> the important thing is that you shouldn't have left ventricular hypertrophy because of this, because you're not going to have as much uh, uh, cardiac output. Your cardiac output can decrease, or at least your stroke volume can, because, because that the amount of blood that can be in there is decreased. But really, we want to say, okay, well, why is the heart working harder? And usually it, it has something to do with, uh, with clogged up vessels, okay? And it has to work harder to push, push past those. Now, going back to that, though, I mean, the reality is we know that athletes, especially distance athletes, um, will have some uh, ventricular hypertrophy because they're working their heart harder. Their heart is actually stronger. Um, and so, uh, but we usually, uh, but, and that can be, that can be a good thing. So, so as long as it's within a certain range, when it, when it gets so large that it's actually restricting the amount of blood that can be in it, that's, that's kind of, uh, not so good, but, but it doesn't have to be from a, a disease process. It can just be because you're working it hard. So types of hypertrophy. I've already kind of mentioned this, uh, I mentioned pathologic, but normal physiologic, that's an increase in muscle mass associated with exercise or other workload demands. Okay, so that's that's just you doing your normal stuff, but putting a little more demand on it. Now, some people, you know, go to the gym and they work out and that's going to cause some uh, hypertrophy to, to take place. And that's not, you know, that's not an illness, that's not a pathology, that's just an increase in demand, and that's good. That's the body working the way it's supposed to. You increase demand, it, it responds to that increase in demand. However, there's a normal pathologic, okay, and normal pathologic means that it's still, it's still, this hypertrophy is still caused by an increase in demand, but in one case, it could be adaptive, so that would be uh, the example of thickening of the urinary bladder due to outflow obstruction. Okay, so if, if you have uh, uh, BPH, benign prosthetic uh, hyperplasia, then, then that's your prostate gland, prostatic, your prostate gland is kind of restricting urine flow. Okay, and if it's restricting urine flow, then that means the detrusor muscle of your bladder has to push harder to get urine to, uh, to flow out. Okay. So that could, that's going to be an adaptation that your detrusor muscle of your bladder is making to push the urine out, uh, but it's pathologic because it's in, it's pathologic because you've got an enlarged prostate gland, okay? So that's, uh, that's normal adaptive. Another normal adaptive could be, um, could be the left ventricular hypertrophy, okay? So, um, so would it, so let's see, due to hypertension, would it be physiologic or would it be pathologic? Well, it would be pathologic, okay? And uh, since I'm talking about it right now, this was supposed to be a, a question later, but would it be adaptive or compensatory? Well, we haven't talked about compensatory yet, but I'm already telling you it's adaptive. It's making an adaptation. And here's, here's why it's different, adaptive versus compensatory. A compensation would be that, let's see, an example is an increase in the size of one kidney after the other is removed. So that means that your other kidney is compensating for a loss of function somewhere else. Now, in the case of left ventricular hypertrophy, you're, you have the hypertrophy. Your ventricle is getting larger because there's more demand. It's trying to push harder. It's not, it's not because it's compensating for you know, your other heart, okay? There isn't another heart, there isn't another left ventricle. It's just, it has to compensate from the increase in demand, okay? Uh, another example, and probably one you should kind of think about, and I'll just ask this question, but you have, you have, let's say you have the quadriceps in your legs, okay? So there, there are four muscles, I'm drawing them poorly here. So there are four muscles in your legs that make up the quadriceps, quad meaning four. Let's say you had some kind of an injury and one of those was lost, okay? So let's say one of these was, was damaged and, and was removed, okay? So this one's gone now, okay? 
So the other three would get larger to make up for that loss. Now, is that going to be compensatory or is that going to be adaptive? And the, and the way to ask this question is, well, these got larger to compensate for the loss of this one. Okay, so these guys had to get larger to make up for even normal demand, but now they all have individually more demand on them because they've lost a muscle. They've lost one of their, their little worker friend helpers. Okay, so, so that would be a compensatory. Okay, so that would be pathologic because you've lost a muscle. Okay, that's not just a normal thing that happens. There's some kind of pathology, some kind of injury that, that took place and they're compensating. So these are getting larger to compensate. So I hope that, I hope that makes sense, the difference between adaptive and, uh, and compensatory. Okay, Oops, I skipped a page there. All right, so let's talk about the plagias. So that was atrophy and hypertrophy. Let's talk about the plagias. Plagia is like from the word plastic. It's a development or formation, a change of some sort. And so there are three terms here, and we'll go over them individually too, but hyperplasia is an increase in cell number, and we can see the picture over here. Uh, metaplasia is a change from one cell type to another, okay, mentioned that earlier. And dysplasia is this word deranged, deranged cell growth, which means we don't know what's going on, but they don't look like they're supposed to look, okay? So uh, dysplasia, deranged cell growth results in cells that vary in size, shape, and organization. So first, let's talk about hyperplasia. The organ may become larger, but it's due to more cells, not larger cells. And a lot of times, uh, hyperplasia can just happen in a certain region. We can just see, like in a uh, in a certain area, that uh, that there are way more cells than than were there or that are in neighboring areas. Okay, so that that would be a hyperplasia. But it, it's important that you understand that it's just more cells. Okay. Uh, almost exclusively found in cells that are capable of myp mitotic cell division. Well, that just makes sense. Uh, you can't really have more cells if the cell can't go through mitosis, if it can't divide. Okay, uh, so you don't see this much in uh, in or you don't see it in skeletal cardiac muscle cells and neurons because those cells aren't capable of mitotic cell division. So examples: regeneration of liver after a partial hepatectomy, hepatectomy, hepatic hepatectomy. So you remove part of the liver, and uh, and so you can see some hyperplasia that, that may take place. Breast enlargement during pregnancy, okay, well, that's a good thing. Uh, you have the, the hyperplasia that's that's uh, occurring because because you have to, because the, uh, the, the new mother will have to produce milk for the baby. Uh, calluses, calluses, that's, you know, that's an increase in demand, and, uh, and you have this wearing down, and so it will turn on genes to start producing cells more quickly, and that can form calluses, and those are, those are good um, normally. So hormones may affect the endometrium, okay, so estrogens or the prostate gland androgens. So now here we can see endometrial hyperplasia, so the endometrium is, um, is driven by, by hormones, progesterone, and, uh, and estrogen. And so you can see here endometrial hyperplasia. Okay, which, which can become out of control. Okay, metaplasia. Metaplasia is kind of an interesting one. It's a reversible change, and I'm going to, I already have that underlined, but I'm going to circle it here. Metaplasia is a reversible change. So it's a reversible change in cell type, and this is usually talking about epithelial tissue. If you remember, we have the, the different types of epithelial tissue. There's, you know, the columnar, the squamous, that's not a good one, but it's okay, uh, cuboidal, and then, uh, and then the uh, uh, transitional, which is pretty much in the, in the uh, bladder. So, but th that's, it's skin, okay? So, so epithelial tissue is skin, but it's not always the outside of the skin, you know, the, the skin on the outside of your body, but it's also skin around in your intestines or in your bladder or, or in your esophagus, all over the place. Okay, so usually a response to chronic irritation and inflammation. Okay, so, so here we can, allows a fragile cell to survive adverse conditions. So I like to, I like to think of it that way. And uh, I have here the example, and I mentioned it a little bit earlier, but cigarette smoking may switch the ciliated columnar epithelial tissue tissues to stratified squamous epithelial tissue. So we often hear about how, uh, I heard this in high school, 
at, about how smoking kills the cilia in your lungs that are supposed to be bringing the mucus and the dirt and the crud up out of your lungs so you can either swallow it or cough it out. But smoking kills those. Well, it doesn't really kill them, but it can trigger metaplasia to take place. And the metaplasia means that these nice, functional, ciliated columnar epithelial cells will change cell type to the squamous epithelial cells, okay? Uh, to the stratified or layered squamous epithelial tissue. And, and that's not going to work on that, you know, that mucus elevator that's bringing, that's bringing the, the uh, mucus up out of, your, out of your bronchi, out of your lungs. Okay, so GERD is another one that can, uh, so acid exposure can go the other way. It's called barrett esophagus, and uh, acid exposure changes the squamous epithelial to columnar mucosal epithelium, okay? So it's so now you have a squamous tissue that was there, okay? And it's going to be replaced by cells that can produce more mucus, okay? So that's kind of an adaptation. If you've got acid in there, well, you need to make more mucus. You need to kind of protect that area. And so it will switch in your esophagus. It can switch cell type from squamous to uh, columnar. Okay, so that's, these are important things to remember. Now, um, while it's not cancer, metaplasia and dysplasia, which we haven't talked about dysplasia, but even more so dysplasia, well, they're not cancer, they are associated with a higher risk of cancer. And the way I like to think of this is that if you're changing cell types, that means you're doing some significant change to, to the DNA. Okay, so first of all, you've got an irritant, you've got something that's causing it to change cell type. Well, once you, I, I think of that, and I know this is kind of, you know, um, a simplistic way of putting it, but I think of it as kind of a slippery slope. Well, if you're going to change cell type, well, cancer is a whole different cell type that divides out of control. Okay, so once you start changing your cell types, then I guess it's uh, it's just a matter of time and a bunch of different, a bunch of a bunch of genetic changes, but. Uh, it's just uh, kind of on that path to, to, to turning cancerous, okay? Um, dysplasia, okay? So dysplasia is the last one. That's the one we use, the word deranged. I don't know, I like that word deranged. Uh, deranged cell growth, and this is also reversible, okay? So that's, that's an important thing to remember. It's often associated with chronic irritation or inflammation. Human papillomavirus, okay? So you may have, you may think, oh, okay, well, I've heard of human papillomavirus or HPV. HPV is associated with an increased risk of cervical cancer. Now, so cervical cancer, how, how are we tested for cervical cancer? Well, we do something called a pap smear, okay? So that means, so if you have, um, you have the vagina, and then there's the cervix up here, which is kind of a little little gateway, and then the uterus is is up here. That's poorly drawn, okay, and then the fallopian tubes. And anyway, um, so so the cervix here, what they will do is they will take a scrape, or or they will they will test the cells here on the cervix, and they will see if they are if they have any kind of hyperplasia or dysplasia, so, so we can see the difference here. I know this is just a picture, but hyperplasia is, is uh, an increase in, in cell number, but dysplasia is going to be more noticeable. You're gonna be able to look at those cells and you're gonna say, okay, well, these don't look like normal cervical cells. So that's where a lot of times it'll say, oh, well, you know, we had some unusual cells that we need to kind of keep an eye on. And that's usually how this starts after a pap smear. We'll say, okay, well, we want you to come back in, you know, early because we want to check this again to make sure something isn't going on because the next steps then are uh, carcinoma and cancer, okay? A carcinoma in situ, which means that it hasn't really moved moved anywhere, but then uh, but then cancer, can it can metastasize and it can become really bad. So, so your first indicator is going to be this, these dysplastic cells or this dysplasia. Okay, so that's what we see down here. Histological analysis of a pap smear can detect dysplastic cells on the cervix, indicating an increased risk for cancer. So that's something you want to you want to keep an eye on when you see those dysplastic cells. Okay, so this is just another another picture of uh, of from your book that uh, 
that kind of says, hey, I mean, here's the normal ciliated epithelium, and then you see this metaplasia that's taken place, and so you've got the normal epithelial, ciliated epithelial that's kind of going away and being replaced by the squamous cell. And then you can see that it has advanced to dysplasia. And now we see this, these dysplastic cells, and, and that's where we start thinking the next step is probably some kind of a uh, carcinoma. Okay, potentially, not always, because like I said, and remember that, it is reversible. Okay, so dysplasia is reversible. So if you have abnormal cells in your cervix, then, uh, then that doesn't necessarily mean that they're never going away and that they're going to be cancerous, but it means that uh, they might go one way or the other and we want them to reverse. Okay, cellular injury occurs if a cell is unable to maintain homeostasis. So we're talking about injury right now. We're not talking about death specifically, although that can happen if you're not able to fix it. Okay, so occurs if unable to maintain homeostasis. So homeostasis means that everything's working right. It's getting the, it's getting the right amount of nutrients. It's doing its job. Everything is, is in place in the way that it's supposed to be there. Um, if it's reversible, then the cells will recover. Okay, so so here we see in this little this little diagram here, we have a normal cell, and then there's some kind of a stressor, and these cells will adapt: atrophy, hypertrophy, uh, metaplasia. They adapt, and uh, and if they if they aren't able to adapt, then there's cell injury. So that means that the cell is not functioning properly, and if you aren't able to fix it then you will have irreversible injury and that cell will be taken out, okay? It will go away. But if it can be fixed, then it's going to be mild, it's going to be temporary, the, the, uh, the cell says, wow, that was close, but we're okay now, you have reversible injury and it goes back to being, to being normal. Okay, so what are some injurious agents? I think we could probably just sort of figure a lot of these out, but physical, physical, would be like trauma, you know, you hit yourself with a hammer and you smash your cells. Well, that's that's injurious and it's going to kill some cells and others are going to uh, to have to uh, to adjust and maybe survive. Uh, heat and cold, electricity, all of these things, these are physical. Radiation. Now, what radiation does is that it can actually uh, change your DNA. Okay, So if it's able to, you know, if it's ionizing, radiation, that means that, well, what ionizing radiation means is that it's throwing out electrons. So elect you're supposed to have the right number of protons and electrons that make up all the atoms in a molecule, and that includes a molecule of DNA. Well, if you have ionizing radiation, it is so powerful that it can hit that DNA and it can start throwing off electrons, okay? Well, that's going to change your DNA and then you're going to have it's going to force mutation, so your um, so your AGTC your nucleotides here are may change. Okay, so they may change, or it just may damage it. It may not be able to correct it. But either way, that can cause damage to the DNA. And then if it causes damage to the DNA, then that's a cell that that may not be able to survive. Or worse yet, it could cause a mutation in a uh, in a uh, like a proto oncogene that we'll talk about when we talk about cancer, and it could actually lead to cancer. Okay, so so that's that's really your when you're talking about radiation, while it can kill uh, proteins and other things, we really worry about it damaging DNA. Okay, if it's non-ionizing, usually non-ionizing radiation isn't isn't so bad. Non-ionizing radiation would be something like uh, radio waves, something like that. Um, those are those are pretty harmless. That's what's in our cell phones. It just uses radio waves. They're they're you know they're not as not as high energy, and so so they just they don't even they don't affect it or they're not supposed to anyway. Uh, chemical drugs, lead, mercury are some examples. Biological agents, bacteria, viruses, parasites. These guys are going to cause cell injury. Uh, nutritional imbalances, fats, minerals, vitamins, amino acids. If you if you have a uh, an unusual either too much or not enough of those, you can have cell injury. The biggest one, okay, so the single, and I have this here in purple, the single most common cause of cellular injury is hypoxic injury. Now, when we talk about hypoxic, we're meaning hypo, which means reduced, and we'll just put oxygen. 
Okay, hypooxygen. So hypoxic injury means it's restricted oxygen to the tissues. If they don't have enough oxygen, then that's a problem. So results from reduced amount of oxygen in the air. Yeah, okay, you go up to the mountains, you don't have as much, much oxygen. Um, loss of hemoglobin or decreased efficacy of hemoglobin. Okay, so that could be associated with certain types of anemias. Decreased production of red blood cell also associated with anemia. Okay which we'll talk about. Diseases of respiratory and cardiovascular systems. Well, you know, if you have a clog, if you have a clot that's, that's clogging your, your vessels, that's really the big one. That's uh, going to cause some ischemia, which is reduced blood flow, and hypoxia, which means you're not getting the oxygen to the cells that need it. Okay, so poisoning of oxidative enzymes within the cells, uh, that could, that could, uh, that's usually talking about ATP production, which is going to, uh, which can also cause problems. So let's kind of go through these a little bit, uh, defining them a little bit better. Uh, hypoxic injury, ischemia is insufficient blood flow. Okay, and we're going to talk about these. Insufficient blood flow, it's the most common cause of hypoxia. Okay, so hypoxia is the most common cause of uh, cellular injury. The most common cause of hypoxia is ischemia. So what we're really what we're really getting to here are things like strokes, um, uh, MI, myocardial infarction. We're talking about uh, uh, a thrombus, like in the in the leg, deep vein, deep vein thrombosis, something something like that that's blocking blood flow for for some reason. Okay, so that's uh, that's really your biggest your biggest cause of uh, of cell of irreversible cell injury anyway. So ischemia. Reperfusion injury, we'll, we'll get into that detail in a minute, but additional injury that can be caused by restoration of blood flow and oxygen. So, and we'll, we'll define these a little better, but mechanisms of re reperfusion, and I'll just quickly tell you what reperfusion is. If we have a clot, okay, and you have a bunch of cells down here that are depending on blood flow, these cells will start to... Um, get damaged. Okay, so Their membranes will get damaged. They're not going to be able to work as efficiently because they don't have enough oxygen to make ATP. And then when you clear the clot, okay, I'll see if I can clear that without deleting everything. So then when you clear the clot and blood flow starts to be provided again, what will happen is you will have too much oxygen and these cells are no longer able to handle it because they've been damaged a little bit and so then they can start to die. Okay, so that's reperfusion injury. Um, so it's oxidative stress, also increased intracellular calcium, inflammation, complement activation, because they, they start to, your own immune system will start to tag them. So we'll talk a bit more about that in a minute. Uh, so cellular injury mechanisms, hypoxia, hypoxic injury, anoxia, which means you don't have any oxygen, cellular responses. Now, this is something I'll spend some time talking about in the next couple of slides, but cellular responses, a decrease in ATP, Okay, so if you don't have oxygen, I, I should say not enough, not enough oxygen, then the, the thing that really requires oxygen is cellular respiration, which is your production of ATP. Okay? The Krebs cycle, remember that? Uh, the Krebs cycle, oxidative phosphorylation, that's all involved with the production of ATP. If you can't make ATP, bringing up some some past physiology here remember the sodium potassium pump okay the sodium potassium pump is pumping in two potassium for every three sodiums that it's pumping out okay that's what the sodium potassium does this is a k potassium okay so that's what the sodium potassium is supposed to do well if it stops functioning then what happens is sodium will build up in here. Okay, because really it's it's kind of a net one that it's kicking out when it's working right. Well, when it doesn't do that, then what happens is you start having more material build up in here. And well, what happens when you have more material building up inside is that's going to pull water in. Okay, that's osmosis. It goes to where there are more particles. So water starts to move in. Okay. And we call that vacuolation, vacuolation because it will initially start to form in little vacuoles. Okay. 
and so you have water that's contained inside the cell. Um, your sodium calcium exchange can't take place, so, so calcium can build up in there, which is going to cause other second messenger molecules uh, to, uh, or processes to take place. And overall, you're going to have cell swelling. Okay. So I have a couple of slides, the slides that, that really talk about it. So uh, I'm kind of going to go through what I just said again. But low oxygen causes ATP depletion, okay, or this says in quotes power failure. Uh, many things lead to hypoxia, so ischemia is the big one. In inadequate amounts of air can do it. Respiratory disease can do it. Lots of things can do it. Mainly, we're talking about ischemia. Uh, without oxygen, ATP production in the mitochondria can't take place, so enzymes that require ATP can't function properly. But like we just said, the major one is this sodium potassium pump. So up to 60% of the ATP in a cell is used to power this sodium potassium pump. Okay, so um, so if we have so hypoxia on energy production, ATP, is aerobic metabolism, that means requiring or using oxygen in the mitochondria it will stop or at least slow way down. Less ATP is produced, you still have glycolysis that can happen. Glycolysis. Okay, spell it however you want it. Uh, but you still have glycolysis that's uh, that's taking place, uh, which is going to which normally produces a little little review here. Normally produces pyruvate, and that pyruvate moves into the mitochondria and the Krebs cycle. Okay. Well, if you don't, if glycolysis doesn't, it's anaerobic. It's it doesn't require O2. Okay. So, so that's fine. So that can still take place, but the trouble is that the Krebs cycle does require O2. Okay. Now, glycolysis can still take place, and it produces two ATP. So you still have some ATP production without oxygen, but instead of producing pyruvate, what it does is it produces something called lactic acid. And then that lactic acid is moved out into the blood and back to the liver. Okay. Or do you follow me on this? Because here's a, here's a question. If I have hypoxia, some kind of hypoxic injury is occurring, and I don't know where it is, maybe it's occurring, maybe it isn't occurring, there's a blood test I can do to figure it out, or at least give me an indication, and that is look for lactic acid. If I see a lot of lactic acid buildup, you know, somebody's having, a, uh, having chest pains and I see an increase in lactic acid, well, then that kind of tells me that maybe there's some area that is not getting enough oxygen because this pyruvate isn't being made and sending it into the Krebs cycle. Okay? I am the worst artist. But, but that's what, that's, what it, that's kind of telling us. So I'm going to see an increase in lactic acid levels. This also occurs with uh, circulatory shock. Uh, a lot of things will, will cause lactic acid levels to increase. Well, a lot of things, well, um, a decrease in oxygen, hypoxia can cause, or ischemia leading to hypoxia, can, can cause an increase in lactic acid. Okay, so uh, anaerobic mechanism glycolysis is required. Lactic acid is produced. Acid can do other things. Uh, it can damage the cell membrane, DNA, interferes with protein function. Your pH is supposed to be what your pH is supposed to be, 735, 745, or in that range. If it drops below that range or even above it, but here we're talking about acidic, then these things, cell membranes can be damaged, DNA won't, won't uh, function properly, and, uh, and proteins won't function properly. Okay, so without enough ATP, enzymatic reactions can't take place, the cell can't perform the way that it's supposed to perform, and, um, and then you have that sodium potassium pump that isn't working, so you have a buildup of water. Lactic acid is going to interfere even more with normal cell function. All of these problems can lead to cell death fairly quickly depending on the cell's requirements. So the brain requires a lot of oxygen. So, that's, so what this is saying is that if you don't have enough oxygen, then lactic acid builds up. Sodium is going to build up inside the cell. Water is going to move in through osmosis, is going to move into the cell. Cell is going to swell. And you're going to have, in the case of the brain, four to six minutes for irreversible damage to take place. This is what kills cells. 
This is when, when someone has a stroke or something like that. This is what happens. Remember that. The cell swells. Okay? It's because of the lactic acid buildup. It's because of water moving in. Okay? And all of that happens. Let's go back. Don't forget this. All of this is happening really because you don't have enough ATP. You can't make the ATP. The ATP is needed for these cells to, to function. And in the case of the brain, they are high demand ATP. So they're the ones that are going to get hit first and earliest and quickest. Okay, and so we call this hydropic degeneration. I'm not too worried about that term, but this is when the sodium potassium pump can't work. And this picture kind of takes you through it. You can see the injury, sodium and water move into or remain in the cell and remove in. Uh, because sodium's, sodium's really at high concentrations on the outside, so it'll start to build up in the cell. The cell damage or the cell membrane can be damaged, and you see the water moving in, and it tries to put it in these vacuoles, but either way, you have, a, you have swelling, okay? You have swelling of the cell. All right, so something else that happens quickly, uh, increased intracellular cal calcium. So cell injury can lead to undesired release of calcium. Normally, calcium is not in the cytoplasm, or if it is, it's at very low levels and only when you need it. And because it's because it's it's sequestered, usually it's sequestered here in the endoplasmic reticulum. Now there are certain processes that require calcium, so calcium can move in from the outside, or it can move from uh, the endoplasmic reticulum as needed. But the trouble is when you have cell damage, this calcium moves out and it's not supposed to. It's moving out in an uncontrolled way. So it can cause a whole lot of different processes to take place. Um, so here's an example of protein kinase C, which is, which is uh, taking place. Here's a, uh, a uh, IB3 sensitive calcium channel. So this is just this, is just this process that's, uh, that's taking place and allowing calcium to, uh, to move out and, uh, and then activate other processes. Now, if that happens without control, then, then you're kind of, uh, that's a cell that uh, is not functioning properly and can die. Okay, so when released, calcium acts as a second messenger normally, so it turns on intracellular enzymes, causes muscle contraction, regulates heart rate, allows neurons to release neurotransmitter. So you can see that if you have damage that causes, that interferes with the ability for tight control of calcium, intracellular calcium levels, then you've got cells that just aren't going to work. So can damage a cell if, uh, if the calcium levels aren't controlled tightly. So um, just calcium can uh, can cause these problems. Something else, reactive oxygen species. Normally, and, and I know this looks complicated here, but this is your mitochondria. When you produce ATP, there are a number of steps that produce something called either reactive oxygen species, which oxygen, I don't know if you've ever heard, but uh, a lot of times people will say oxygen is toxic. Yes, it is toxic, but we need it to survive. The, the thing is, the way we've adapted, is that we produce something called antioxidants. Okay, so we have these antioxidants there, and the reason that oxygen is 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 quote unquote toxic, it's 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 not if everything's working right, uh, but but it's because it's highly reactive, and it'll produce these intermediaries that are um, that are very reactive. Uh, here's an example here, superoxide. So we can see, let's see, superoxide is it's in here somewhere, right there. Uh, hydroxyl radicals, so, so free radicals. Um, not sure where that is. There we go. So there's that one. Hydrogen peroxide, it's not a free radical, but it is a reactive. It's a, it's a, re, it's a species that is reactive and has oxygen, so it's a reactive oxygen species. And, uh, and we can see here... Um, Let's see, they're here. But you can also see each way along along here, the superoxide, there's something called superoxide dismutase that detoxifies that, that, that free radical, that superoxide free radical. Um, you can see that you have glutathione reductase that, that can detoxify the, uh, the hydroxyl. Glutathione peroxidase is, it can detoxify the peroxide. So we have mechanisms in place to detoxify these free radicals and these reactive oxygen species. The problem is if we can't do that, these guys will react with whatever's in the area, whether that's a protein that we need, it, it could be 
any any protein it could be cell membrane lipids it could be really anything that it comes into contact with so we have to tightly control these and antioxidants that we produce and you can get them in your diet as well um, will will help detoxify these okay and so so a lot of times it's that damage that uh, that can build up and, uh, and and we're constantly sort of fighting we need we need ATP so we're using this oxygen but we're constantly fighting these intermediary steps that are causing these toxic uh, uh, free radicals and, and oxygen species okay so free radicals reactive oxygen electrically uncharged atom or group of atoms having an unpaired electrons now if you electron if you remember from chemistry Electrons like to be paired with something, and that's what I was saying earlier. These will react with whatever. They're going to pair with something. They're going to steal steal an electron from somewhere. What antioxidants do is that they provide something with them to bind to, okay, to keep them from from damaging something else. Okay, uh, so lipid peroxidation, cell membrane damage can take place. Uh, alteration of proteins, alteration of DNA, mitochondrial function can be affected. Now, I mentioned earlier reperfusion injury. And remember that, and I said, okay, we're out of oxygen, and uh, that's bad. Okay, so there's a thrombus or a clot. So we've restricted oxygen flow, which means that this cell over here doesn't have enough oxygen to survive, which means that it's not, its sodium potassium pump isn't working right, which means that it's filling up with fluid, it's... Uh, and, and there are certain proteins and enzymes that aren't working the way that they're supposed to. Well, guess what? What I just mentioned, your antioxidants that are being supposed to be produced to protect you from oxygen are also not functioning properly. Okay? So think about that. You don't have, an, you're not producing, or this cell isn't getting very much oxygen at the moment in this top frame. It's not getting very much oxygen, so it's still surviving but it's getting some membrane damage, okay? It's, it's not happy. It's getting some membrane damage. It's not producing enzymes and proteins the way that it should. It's filling up with fluid. And then you suddenly say, oh, oh, we got it fixed. Here's all of your oxygen back. Well, now there's all of this oxygen that's in there. We already have a cell that's weakened. Maybe it's not producing the antioxidants that it needed to deal with the oxygen. So now here it is, it's producing these reactive oxygen species and these free radicals, but it can't fix it. And so that cell will just, it, it actually, the ox, returning the oxygen to it will kill the cell. Okay, and we call that reperfusion. And so what we can see a lot of times is, um, is like if somebody has an MI, myocardial infarction, a heart attack, and then you give it a clot buster, you give it what's called TPA, tissue plasma engine activator, it breaks this clot up, and you get blood flow again. And then you'll start seeing some of these cardiac enzymes increasing, this troponin levels, because all of a sudden these cells are dying. And they're dying because you've restored oxygen. Now, does that mean you shouldn't restore oxygen? No, it doesn't. But it does mean that if you start seeing things like... Uh, like dysrhythmias that may occur, you start seeing these increased levels of, uh, of cardiac proteins indicating damage is taking place, that could be from this reperfusion injury. Okay? Uh, so it's something you really need to watch after, after providing the TPA. You need to kind of keep an eye on this and make sure that you know the cells that are dying and damaged maybe aren't uh, uh, autorhythmic cells and so, or, or uh, cells that are uh, transferring electrical signals, okay, because that can result in dysrhythmia. Okay, so that's reperfusion injury. So uh, let me read through this real quick. During hypoxia, the cells uh, the cells are starved of oxygen. This weakens the cell membrane, prevents the produ production of antioxidants. When blood flow is restored, it is rich in oxygen, and without these antioxidants to detoxify the free radicals and other react reactive oxygen species, that will be formed, the cells can die, can result in dysrhythmias after restoring blood flow following a myocardial infarction, as well as we'll, we'll learn about like increased um, uh, 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 troponin, troponin levels, which is, a, uh, which is a protein, well, it's a type of troponin that's specific to the heart that's when it spills out, you know that there have been damaged 
heart muscles. Okay, um, so cellular injury mechanisms, I just kind of put all these on one page. I think a lot of them kind of make sense. Chemical injury, xenobiotics just means something that came from somewhere else. It's not something that the body produces, so it's something that had to be, you know, ingested or absorbed somehow. But carbon tetrachloride, lead, carbon monoxide, ethanol, mercury, social street drugs, trauma, I think trauma makes sense, blood, blunt force injuries, sharp injuries, gunshot wounds, these are all things that can damage cells. Infection, uh, pathogenicity of a microorganism, if it becomes pathogenic or if it if it divides and, and becomes problematic enough. D disease producing potential, invasion and destruction, toxin production, production of hypersensitivity reactions, with which we haven't talked about yet. Uh, chemical agents, including drugs, over-the-counter and prescribed drugs can cause this. It's a uh, leading cause of child poisoning. So there can be direct damage where, they, where the chemicals and drugs injure the cells by combining with molecules that they shouldn't combine with, that we need. Uh, chemotherapeutic drugs, which by design, chemotherapy drugs are really hard on cells. Uh, they hit rapidly dividing cells, and so that means they can they can actually damage uh, perfectly normal cells. That's uh, it's that's just kind of how they work. Uh, drugs of abuse can do that, and then hypersensitivity. We'll talk about that. Uh, rashes, immune mediated. That's uh, hypersensitivity is uh, like allergies, kind of. Okay, but a little broader than that. Uh, cellular accumulations, water can build up, water toxification, you can if you drink too much water, lipids, carbohydrates can build up, glycogen, proteins, um, all of those things. So, uh, sometimes cells die, okay? Uh, sometimes they, they sort of live their life and uh, they've done enough and, uh, and they, they start to kind of get messed up and, uh, and, and they, will, they will die. Hopefully that happens via apoptosis, programmed cell death or cell suicide. That's when that, this is normal. So you replace worn out cells to make room for more. Uh, gets rid of cells that are no longer necessary. So this really a lot of apoptosis happens during development. So this is why we don't have webbed fingers. Our fingers start out webbed and then those webs, webs undergo apoptosis and the webs go away and we have spaces between our fingers. Okay. Uh, immune cells trigger apoptosis to kill infected cells. Uh, apoptosis also gets rid of immune cells following a, an, an infection. So we'll talk about that a little bit more with immunity. Uh, there are many uses for normal physiologic apoptosis. Apoptosis isn't necessarily a bad thing. Necrotic cell death, almost always a bad thing. Okay. Unregulated death caused by injuries to cells. The cells may swell. We've talked about how that happens, and I hope that makes sense. And rupture, and then uh, inflammation, which we'll also discuss. Okay, so let's quickly go through necrosis. It's a sum of cellular changes after local cell death in the process of cellular autodigestion. Okay, um, so this is a uh, so necrosis is not the same as apoptosis. Um, a lot of times it can it can uh, kind of spread to other cells and that's really the problem because because it may uh, leak its uh, its insides especially like calcium I mean if a cell kind of explodes and suddenly there's a lot of calcium and that calcium can make its way into the next cell uh, that kind of thing but we're gonna we're gonna look at a few different types of necrosis coagulative uh, liquefactive caseous and then we'll talk about uh, gangrene wet and dry gangrene and gas gangrene. So those are the last things we need to discuss. So necrosis, inflammation, cell swelling, rupture of the membrane. We don't want to see that. That doesn't happen with apoptosis. It's, it's very nicely and neatly taken away and then eaten by uh, macrophage, which usually is the way that apoptosis takes place. But in necrosis, the cell swells, it, may, it ruptures, and spills its guts all over all the other cells, and then the other cells can die. Okay, so mechanism is determined by the type of injury and type of tissue. So we're going to talk about liquefactive uh, necrosis, coagulation necrosis, and caseous necrosis. Okay, and I left the definition here, but I'm gonna I'm gonna rewrite that, so I'm not gonna read it right now. Okay, so first of all, let's look at liquefaction, and here's the thing. Liquefaction, let's just think about the name, undergoes liquefaction, okay? So liquid, liquid, fluid, gooey, okay? So some of the cells die, but their catalytic, catalytic enzymes are not destroyed. Catalytic, catalytic enzymes can break down other things, and so what it's doing is a cell 
dies and then it starts to kind of dissolve a lot of things that are that are in the area okay and so that can cause liquefaction which means that it's breaking things down and it's becoming soluble and liquefied okay so an example softening of the center of an abscess which is commonly seen in brain tissue so that means that there's some damage that took place and then those enzymes moved out and started damaging other areas in the in the in the region in that local local area and uh, and and cause that that liquefaction to take place okay so remember that catalytic enzymes are not destroyed and that's that's the uh, that's the big that's the big difference there now with coagulation and also it's kind of important that this is normally what we see in brain tissue but in something called uh, coagulation we see that more in uh, cardiac muscle tissue which is what this is a picture of okay and we can see it down here okay this yellowish area so I know it says gray but a firm gray mass of coagulation so acidosis develops denatures the enzymatic and structural proteins of the cell okay so now we have the cells that are not functioning the way that they're supposed to and they and they can kind of kind of build up in there and then you have these uh, these dead cells that can that can kind of accumulate now we'll, we'll make a difference between uh, between this one and uh, caseus but coagulation characteristic of hypoxic injury commonly seen in cardiac muscle cells so this is denaturing of the enzymatic and structural proteins of the cells and it forms this firm gray mass now the last one is caseus and now the difference here the dead cells persist okay so so with these other two with liquefaction and coagulation you may see this mass that forms but then this mass can sort of be taken away and and it goes away with uh, usually usually some kind of an immune response but this last one here caseus the dead cells persist so that means that so what happens is macrophages will come in and they'll try to remove these cells but then the macrophages kind of get caught in it too okay and so it causes this this uh, this cheesy looking looking uh, this mass okay so dead cells persist distinctive form of coagulation necrosis most commonly associated with tubercular lesions and it's thought to result from immune immune mechanisms so that means that the immune system or macrophages primarily will come in try to clear dead and dying cells that are dying from the uh, the tuberculin uh, pathogen and and they will they will then kind of uh, engulf these but then the macrophages themselves are kind of caught in that and that's what's causing this caseous uh, mass and so we can see these as tubercular lesions a lot of times they just get walled off and and it kind of gives up on it and so we can see uh, we, a lot of times these things will will persist for a uh, for a very long time or forever okay so gangrene we have maybe heard of gangrene there are a couple of different types. There's dry gangrene, and this picture down here is of dry gangrene. Okay, this is really pretty pretty straightforward. Dry gangrene, well, it's dry, which means it's not getting fluid, which means the definition a lack of arterial blood supply. Okay, so that means the blood isn't getting to these areas. So you normally would have blood vessels that are that are sending blood to these areas and feeding these cells. Well, the blood supply is cut off. This is common in, uh, in diabetes, where these small vessels are damaged and they can't provide blood flow to these, to these areas. And a lot of times it's, it's in areas far away from the heart, the periphery, usually in the feet. Okay? Um, so arterial blood supply is, uh, is, is uh, restricted or somehow interfered with. And... Uh, but but venous flow can still carry fluid out so what happens is that you don't have blood to these areas and and the cells will die and that's a uh, form of, of of gangrene dry gangrene uh, wet gangrene means that you don't have venous flow okay so so that means that you're not going to have good circulation but you still have arterial flow which means fluid is accumulating in the tissue that's going to be wet gangrene okay uh, a lot of times you'll see blistering fluid build up in these areas. That's that's kind of an indication of wet gangrene. Either way, you're going to have necrosis that's going to take place. So tissues tend to liquefy, and a, an infection is likely. Now, the important thing to remember, 
write this down or just, re just remember it. Dry gangrene, wet gangrene are not caused by infection. These are associated with blood supply. Okay, either blood isn't getting there, blood isn't able to leave, but they're both associated with blood supply and they do cause necrosis. Gas gangrene, what happens is you end up with an infection of uh, a clostridium infection and that can produce toxins and it produces H2S, um, bubbles, sul sulfuric, sul uh, some kind of H2S gas. I can't remember my chemistry right now, what that's called, which is embarrassing. But either way, um, you have the uh, this uh, this this uh, I, we guess we can call it dihydrogen sulfide. Uh, but you've got this these sulfurous uh, gassy bubbles that that can form. Okay, and uh, and that can smell. It would smell like like sulfur. So um, and that that can cause. Uh, but that's associated with gas gangrene. So whatever caused it to begin with is usually a uh, uh, a blood flow problem, but this clostridium can infect it, and uh, and so that would be referred to as gas gangrene. Okay, and I believe that is the last slide.